Good morning. My name is Eric Brooks. I am the curator here at Ashland and Henry Clay Estate. And I am coming to you today with Wake Up with Ashland. We're starting a new series today. It's called Artifact Adventures. As curator here at Ashland, I'm responsible for researching and caring for the 3,000 or so artifacts in our collection. We've got some amazing stories in our collection. And I'm gonna take the opportunity, since we're closed for regular tours, to feature some of the artifacts in the collection that we don't normally get to speak about a great deal on tour. Uh, and we're gonna get up close to them, talk about the stories they contain, uh, how they came to be here. We'll look a little bit into how we do what we do at Ashland. So I hope you enjoy it. Uh, today we're going to start with one of my very favorite artifacts in the collection. And without further ado, let's get to the artifact of the day. Today's artifact is pretty spectacular. You can see it there. It is, as you can see, beaded. Uh, there are two pieces. The strap at the top with the three fingers at the end goes with this square piece. That is a bandolier bag. A bandolier bag is worn over the shoulder at the hip, more or less, and is used to carry cartridges, uh, percussion caps, powder, flints, any of the things necessary for hunting with a musket or rifle. The belt is the other artifact. It is a decorative piece meant to be worn at the waist. You can see it's got Henry Clay's first initial and last name on it, H. Clay. So it must have had some connection directly to him. It's got eagles and flowers at the end. Uh, you can see that the uh, straps for it are woven and little beads are woven into the straps and they end in tassels. Uh, you can look at the, the strap of the bag. You can see some of the design work. There are multiple, there are two designs, one on each side. And then there are several designs on the bag. Now, the only information we had when we came to these materials was this note right here. And it says, bead bag and belt given to Henry Clay by Indians, loaned by Mrs. Thomas S. Bullock. Mrs. Thomas S. Bullock is Henry Clay's great granddaughter, Nanette McDowell Bullock. She was the last owner of the mansion. Uh, she lived in the mansion, well, became the mistress of the estate essentially and when her mother died in 1917 and lived here until her death in 1948. There are three very important pieces of information that are contained in this little tiny note. Uh, the first obviously is that the material belonged to Henry Clay. That's critically important. That makes it one of the more important pieces in our collection. The second item that is very, very important is that it was given to him by the Indians. That tells us where to start with research to understand what this is and why it's important. Now we know who it came from and where to look when looking for information. The third piece of information, which is quite interesting, is the last line where it says, loaned by Mrs. Thomas S. Bullock. Now that does not refer to Ashland. That is actually much older. That was probably written, that note, about 1900. And it refers to something that Nanette and her sisters and her mother and other uh, upper class women in Lexington did from time to time. They would gather things like this from their homes, things that were not only important to their family, but had historical importance to the community, maybe to the country, and they would exhibit them at places like the Lexington Public Library. And they would charge admission to these exhibits. And that admission would be given to charity at a later date. So these charitable exhibitions raise money for various causes. And this loan by means that she loaned this material to one of these exhibits. So it was seen in Lexington at that time as part of that exhibit. So that's really fascinating. Uh, doesn't help us a lot with what the story is, but it's an interesting piece of the story, no less. So let's come down here. I want to take a look at this photograph. It's actually a uh, uh, printout of a painting in the collections of the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts in North Carolina. This is a uh, Creek boy. His name is Mr. P. Son of a chief, you can see that he is wearing a bandolier bag and a belt, not unlike ours. So that gives you some idea of how these items were used by Native Americans. So that's really important. Uh, that helps us understand what this material was used for. I don't know that Henry Clay ever wore this material or used this material, but that's how they would have done so. Now, how do we research this? How do we take 
extract the story? Well, there are several ways that we go about this. And we can start by looking at it as Native American material. We want to identify tribal affiliation. We want to perhaps uh, understand what it means. And so we can start that by doing Internet searching on uh, Native American beadwork. So uh, I did that. I found in the Antiques Roadshow there is a bag very similar to ours. You can go on their website at pbs.org and look at the Roadshow, and you can look that all up. This is from an auction house. Uh, up in Cincinnati, they had a bag for sale. Again, very similar to the one that we have. So that's good information. That gives me, again, sort of a starting point uh, that this might be Delaware. But this is not an end point. This information is not necessarily the most reliable. So the next step is to come over to looking at other museums. So I consulted with a number of people in the Missouri Historic History Museum, for example. They had material in their collection of a similar nature. If I can get this open here. Here is a bag they had. Um, and you can see some similar designs and, and design elements. Um, and that's a, a, another Delaware bag. So I went to museums like that. Uh, museums tend to be you can go there and get information that is very reliable. This is uh, material that I got from a curator, I believe at the, yeah, the National Museum of the American Indian, which is part of the Smithsonian. Um, if you're going to do this research, uh, again, that's uh, well worth doing. Uh, Nelson Atkins Museum of Art, which is uh, in Kansas City, a very fine museum. Um, more material. This is actually from my predecessor here at Ashland. Go to friends and colleagues. Uh, the Detroit Institute of Art. And then, for those of you who are in Indiana, if anybody is, uh, the Idle Jord, which is a prominent museum of Western and Native American art. I consulted with some curators there who were actually Native American. And the sum total conclusion of all of this information that I collected, I'll save that one, is that the material in our collection can be affiliated, well, the bag at least, with a tribe pretty easily. It is Lenape or Delaware. Uh, the Delaware made these pretty regularly. Uh, and it is diagnostic, the three, three little pieces at the end, these designs, the bag, the design of the bag, those are all pretty typical Delaware designs. So that is pretty easy to establish. The belt is a little harder because this belt isn't necessarily truly what you would call traditional native design. It is designed as a gift. That makes it a little harder to attribute. Um, so we have a little greater difficulty saying by whom that might have been made. Could be Cherokee, uh, could be Creek, could be any number of tribes who were using this type of material. So that didn't answer that question. One other thing that I found is this document... Uh, when I was doing this research, I actually did a Google search on Google Books looking for references to material of this sort. And I found a reference in a very old exhibition catalog for a museum, uh, the Mercer Museum in Bucks County Historical Society, Doylestown, PA, which is actually right close to where my sister lives, oddly enough. Uh, so I found this information that they have a belt that matches ours. It even has Henry Clay on it. That's crazy important. That is really amazing. What I found out is that that belt had been given by Henry Clay's son Thomas to another gentleman who in turn gave it to another gentleman who in turn gave it to someone else who eventually gave it to their museum. Now I have independent confirmation of what Nanette said in her note right here that this is Henry Clay. That's really important. Now it would, I would be surprised if any branch of the family got that wrong, but to have two different, completely separate branches get that information and deliver that information, now I have good confirmation on that. Uh, question was asked, where were the Delaware located? Well, they started out geographically in near Delaware, thus the name, but they were pushed westward across Ohio into Illinois and eventually on to Oklahoma. So uh, at the time that Henry Clay was living, the Delaware would have been, I think, in Illinois or on the upper Midwest, uh, and eventually, not long after, they were pushed uh, further west. So we can say those are Delaware. 
The bag is Delaware. The belt is hard to determine. What that doesn't tell us is why they were given to Henry Clay or who may have given them and what the context for that is. So for that information, we turn to the papers of Henry Clay. There are 11 volumes. I have them behind my desk in my office. And uh, they are my first source of information when I do research because they are primary source materials on Henry Clay. uh, And they're the best place to look in terms of understanding uh, Henry Clay and looking for information on this. And the first thing I did was try to find any reference to a gift of beaded material like this. Wasn't there. Unfortunately, there's no letter, there's no document of any kind that specifies that he received it or that, in fact, he acknowledged it, which is unusual. He normally does, and he may have, and it may just simply not exist. Anyway, Uh, So when I went to the books, the next thing to look at was Native American information in general. So if we go back here to the index, flip to the index, we can see that there's actually quite a lot on Indians in here, uh, starting right there. There we go. So you can see there's a lot of references in a lot of different ways on Indians. And this volume is material dating between 1829 and 1836. Someone, uh, Marilyn, asked if it was common to put a person's name onto a belt like this. The answer to that is not really. Uh, This obviously was a gift. They did it because it was a gift. Uh, It would not have been done that way probably amongst uh, native peoples themselves. I mean, it wouldn't have been what they did for their own belts. So I'm going to go here now. Uh, I, I marked two references. This one is a letter Uh, to a man named James Conover. And if you flip to the next page, Clay says here, another idea has occurred to me in regard to the most flitigious measure, the Indian Bill, which threatens to bring a foul and lasting stain upon the good faith, humanity, and character of the nation. This consequence can only be averted now in one way. The bill can only be carried into effect by treaties. These treaties must be ratified by the Senate unless indeed their agency be dispensed with, which I hardly suppose will be attempted. Would it be not well not be well to prepare the public mind to reject the treaties. They will probably teem with odious corruption. What he's talking about here is something that happened in 1830. May of 1830, a bill was passed called the Indian Removal Act, which authorized President Andrew Jackson to treat with a group of tribes living in the southeastern United States. And there were five tribes that were principally affected by this. The Cherokee, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, the Creek, and the Seminole. And the goal was to convince those tribes to move west onto lands given them uh, on the other side of the Mississippi River. Why did Andrew Jackson want to do that? Because he wanted that land to be opened up to white settlers, principally to be turned into plantations, ultimately cotton plantations. And eventually, that's exactly what happened. Uh, These Native Americans... Uh, were pushed west. They were pushed west involuntarily, became an act of genocide. Many died on the way to Oklahoma, and then many more died once they got there. Henry Clay opposed Indian removal, not because he necessarily uh, believed in equal rights for Native Americans. Uh, In fact, he said of Native Americans that their culture would probably die out before much longer, and it wouldn't be a great loss. His concern was that the United States had entered into treaties with these people, and that these treaties were documents that bound both the Native Americans and the United States, and that it would be dishonorable, it would be a stain upon our national character, we would be judged badly by foreign countries if we violated those treaties unilaterally, which is exactly what Andrew Jackson did. Uh, He would make treaties and then fail to live up to them uh, and continue to push people further west. One of the people he pushed was the Cherokee. That is one of the best known of these forced migrations. It was called the Trail of Tears. Many, many Cherokee died going to Oklahoma. And we have another letter here. This is from 1835. This is actually a comment that Clay made in the Senate, and he's supporting the Cherokee in dealing with the state of Georgia and the fact that the state of Georgia is trying to take their land. Um, And he spoke several times on behalf of the Cherokee, became a real friend to the Cherokee in supporting them in at least having their treaties enforced. They were very thankful for his efforts, and it would be likely that they would present him material of this sort in appreciation for what he did for them. 
So it makes sense to think that this might have been presented by the Cherokee. Now, we've said this was Delaware, so how does that work? Well, the Delaware made this material not only for themselves, but they made it in addition for others and would sell it or trade it to other groups. So the Cherokee may have acquired this from the Delaware and then given it to Henry Clay. Now, the belt they may have made themselves. That's hard to say. Uh, but the point of the matter is they are the group that Henry Clay had the most interaction with and is most likely to have given it. So we have come to the conclusion this material was probably given by the Cherokee. I wish we had an exact answer, and maybe someday we'll come across a document that gives us that answer. Right now, that hasn't happened. So uh, we'll see what happens in the future. You never know what you might, you might come across. Uh, the importance of this, of course, again, is that it reminds us of this period in American history in the 1830s when these people were pushed across the Mississippi, and so many of them died. One of the other effects of uh, Indian removal was that it did open up this land. Great plantations were built, which caused a great increase in demand for enslaved people in those areas, which meant that in Lexington, for example, uh, there became a great marketplace for enslaved people, and they were sold in Lexington, taken down to places like New Orleans, resold to individuals who own plantations there or sold directly to individuals here who are operating plantations in the Deep South. So uh, a lot of interaction between slavery and Indian removal. Um, the two had great consequence on one another, and certainly that was true uh, for Henry Clay. He interacted uh, and was involved with uh, Indian removal, um, fighting against it. And, of course, as a slave owner, um, it impacted the way he owned slaves as well. So I think these are really remarkable, really important artifacts in our collection, uh, and I wish they were out more than they are. Uh, but they're very, very fragile, um, and we don't really right now have a great way to display them on a regular basis, so they generally come out only at very special times. And that's why I wanted to start with this today. Uh, I think it's a fascinating story. Uh, you may wonder where we got this. I don't think I covered that. And that is in itself a fascinating story. So when Lynette died in 1948, she left the house and the contents in her will to the Henry Clay Memorial Foundation to operate as a museum, and they still do. That's who operates Ashland. We're a completely private nonprofit. Uh, so uh, the, this became the property of the HCMF. Uh, it took the HCMF about 50 years <laughs> to go through the house and eventually discover all of its contents. This, in fact, was not discovered until about 1999 in a bag in the attic under the eaves. And actually, we're going to talk about at least one other piece as I do this that was discovered, I think, in a similar fashion. So I'll come back to that another time when I do that artifact. You can see the beads. They're little tiny little glass beads. Um, these became quite common in Native American art after Europeans arrived. Prior to European contact, this was done with porcupine quills, which were colored. It's pretty really beautiful stuff. Uh, amazing amount of work. We've actually had it conserved. Uh, it was an, an incredibly laborious process. Look at Henry Clay's name here. Isn't that nice? You can look, if you look carefully, you can see some of the beads are almost metallic in color or nature. Um, mostly they're glass. Let's look at the cords here. Little white beads sewn on the edge. I tried once, I thought about once, unbraiding these so you could see the individual strands, but they're so brittle and fragile that you can't do that. The bag is missing some of the fringe, and there may at one time have also been little metal cones or other things uh, that were attached as decoration. Uh, Marilyn asked about coloring the beads. That's done when the beads are made, and it involves adding substances. For example, one can make glass red by adding gold. I don't know what is added to this glass to make it the various colors that it is, but that's all part of the manufacturing process. Uh, 
Well, thank you very much for joining me today for Artifact Adventures. I'll be back next week. I have an artifact next week. I think you'll find really fascinating. It's a really amazing story. And we're going to talk a little bit struggling. So uh, we'd be pleased for any support you can offer at this time. Thank you very much. And have a good day. And we'll see you. Cameron will be back next Tuesday. And I'll be back next Thursday. Thank you.